That's true. <laughs> I know this goes without saying, but uh, what an honor and a privilege it is to be here tonight. A special hello from the folks in <clears throat> Madisonville. This church uh, means a great deal to them, as well as your pastor does. For about three and a half years, I guess, uh, Brother Maurice was unable to preach, unable to be in services. And this church, from your preacher's class, sent man after man there to preach for them. And they've never forgotten it. And I never forgotten it. It, uh, it was... It, it was bread and a time of famine for them and hello from the folks there they love you as do i if you would turn with me to genesis chapter 2 to begin with uh, aaron and todd both asked me before services if i had anything particular to read or what my text was and i said well this probably wasn't the best answer to give, but I said, well, I'm just kind of all over the place tonight. Well, I hope that's not so in my message, but uh, with the text, maybe. Here in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2, we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, that being Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There was a program on television for several years called Intervention. I'm sure some of you have seen that program. This show followed individuals who were addicted to drugs or other type of vices. And I could say it this way in watching the program is they could not not do drugs, it seemed. Just like we cannot not sin. And this show followed uh, individuals addicted to drugs and having reached the lowest point in their lives. This is just sad. Uh, they must agree to be helped by an intervention, and that's what the show was about. Uh, most of those ag who agreed or decided upon treatment either never finished the uh, program, the intervention, and most of them didn't continue in their sobriety. Every now and then one would, but not many. Most of those um, went back to their own ways and even perished because of their unwillingness and inability to change. I can relate to that. You see, tonight I want to talk to you, though, about another kind of intervention. It's called a divine intervention. It's the only intervention that really matters when all is said and done. And this is an intervention that every single one of us are in need of. The sad thing is, is that many will never know it. I speak of an intervention from the addiction of sin. We've got a desperate disease. And it's called sin. It's such a small word with such devastating results and you know that's um, the kind of intervention that I need I need an intervention from God and what's so beautiful in this divine intervention the undeserving sinner has no decision or will in the matter they would ask these on the program will you go to an intervention and like I said some said no and some said yes, but in this divine intervention, we have no decision, no will in the matter. You know, the chosen sinner cannot and will not come to God. So God, the divine one, must come to us. And I'm so thankful that he does. 
Now the words addict and addiction are not found in the scripture, but Paul did say in Romans 7 very plainly these words. He said, I'm sold under sin. What is it to be sold under sin? He was a captive to sin. He was addicted to sin. And we too have sold out to sin. All of us have. Every addict of sin will tell you the same thing. They do what they shouldn't do. Uh, they don't do what they should do. They wish they didn't sin. I, I really wish that I didn't sin. But I do. They hate that they sin. I hate that I sin. Uh, how to perform what is good, I find not. What hope then is, does any sinner have of being saved? A divine intervention. What is a divine intervention? Well, divine means godly. Divine means holy. So I know that this must come from the divine one. This must come from one who is holy. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. We know that. You've been well taught that. And in order for the holy justice of God to be satisfied, God must divinely intervene in our lives. He must reveal to us what we are. A man who does not see his need, a woman that does not see her need, will never see their need of a Savior. God must reveal Christ to us. To intervene means to come between. Come between. Christ must come between us and God. God must prevent or alter a course of events. God must change our end result. You know, the word intervene <clears throat> means to intercede. Christ must intercede. God must involve himself. God must mediate. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's our divine intervention. It's called discriminating mercy. It's called distinguishing grace. The Lord said, I'll have mercy on, upon whom I'll have mercy and whom I will, I harden it. That's at his discretion. Many think that this salvation that you and I cherish is an act of their free will. I'll tell you this for certain. If, a, if God ever shows a sinner what their free will is capable of doing, they'll beg God to take their free will from them. A man that boasts about their free will doesn't know God. God, show me what I am. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and you know what? It'll always be flesh. Never be anything more. Flesh can be nothing else. I heard a man recently say in a reference to his morality, he said, I think I'm getting better. Well, you may think you are, but you'll never be good enough. Never. No matter how much you will to be, you'll never be any better because you have to be perfect. Well, that's a word I don't know much about. Perfect. Oh, we use the word a lot, but we, we use it wrongly. A baby's born and we go, oh, it's just perfect. <laughs> we don't know much about it. That's why the Lord told Nicodemus, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. God must divinely intervene in your life. God must interrupt. God must come between you and a thrice holy God. How did we get in this predicament? Well, Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore is by one man, one man, that being Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. 
In John 3, 19, you know the passage. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see, being evil, uh, loving darkness, we're condemned. By nature, we love darkness rather than light. God must give us life. God must divinely intervene. Intervene, And that's been the case since sin came into the world. Uh, turn over a page, you may not have to, but Genesis chapter 3, you know the story well. Look at verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Look at verse 9. And the Lord called unto Adam. Divine intervention. And he said unto him, Where art thou? And he, Adam, said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And you know the rest of the story. Adam blamed his disobedience on his wife, and Eve blamed her disobedience on the serpent, and both of them blamed it on God. Men and women still do that. We're good at playing the blame game. Men today say, well, if God is sovereign, if it's God alone that says, uh, if God always has his way and if God always has his will, then why and how does he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? If I'm only doing what God willed, then how can he condemn me if I don't believe? You know how Paul answered that? Nay, but O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Adam and Eve endeavored to cover themselves with fig leaves by the work of their own hands. Men still trying to do it. Men and women still trying to. Look down at verse 21. And to Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? You know what that is? That's divine intervention. That was God involving himself. That was God becoming between them and death, wasn't it? Divine intervention is distinguishing grace. Divine intervention is discriminating mercy. Divine intervention is the Lord Jesus Christ. Who made the difference between Abel and Cain? Uh, they both heard the teaching of their father Adam. But it, to Abel it was made effectual, but it wasn't to Cain. Who made them to differ? You know the answer. Your pastor recently preached on that. It's God that makes the difference. God would not accept the work of Cain's hands. I've often thought about those vegetables and fruit that Abel, um, that Cain brought before the Lord. Don't you know they were prized? They were probably the best and the, the most fruitful fruit and vegetables you'd ever seen. But there wasn't a blood sacrifice. God won't accept anything less. He accepts only an offering of blood, and Abel believed God through a godly intervening. What about Enoch? Enoch walked with God. You know why? Because God walked with him. That's exactly why. Turn over just a page or two to Genesis chapter 6. You know these verses. But I want us to consider them in the light of God's divine interrupting in our lives. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that 
every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's a familiar verse, but you stop and dwell on that for a while. Every thought of a man's imagination is only evil, and it's only evil continually. My, we're in, we're in bad shape. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace made Noah to differ. God's the only supplier of grace. God made Noah to differ. You know what that is? A divine intervention. It was a godly intervention that saved Noah. No, you know, Noah was no less a sinner than anyone else on earth. Noah found grace where? In the eyes of the Lord. Noah wasn't looking for grace. How do I know? Well, there's none that seeketh after God. None. You know what none means? None. <laughs> none. What do you have that you did not receive? What do any of us have that God didn't give us? How did we receive the salvation that we enjoy? By the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It always comes back to that. That's what the gospel is. God in Christ doing for me what I cannot and what I will not do for myself. Yes. Cannot and will not. My Salvation's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to what? His mercy. He saved us. Divine intervention can be summed up in two words. You know what they are, but God. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I bet you know what that is. And you hath he quickened. And you, hath you quickened? No. <laughs> and you hath he quickened, God quickened. You and I were dead in trespasses and sin. I've never seen a dead man do anything. It's God who interrupts to give us life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's God intervening. You know, the church at Corinth, bless their hearts. I see myself in them so much. They were preacher worshipers. You know, one said, I like Paul, and the other said, well, Apollos is my man. And Paul told them they were carnal, fleshly minded, minding the things of the flesh. The question then is not who Paul is. Who then is Paul, he asked. Who then is Apollos? Just ministers, just voices crying in the wilderness, just voices that God used to preach the gospel that you believe. That's all preachers are. If you know the gospel, it's because God divinely revealed it to you. A divine revelation. That's another message. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God. Divine intervention, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Turn over a few pages to Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, called him the father of the faith. You know, he was not always a man of faith. He was an idolater. He was an idol maker. <laughs> he lived in an idolatrous country. He didn't know God, nor did he want to. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Now look at this. And 
I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will. <laughs> Who will? God will. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed. Look at those words. As the Lord hath spoken unto thee. That's divine intervening. What did uh, God do concerning Abraham? He butted in divinely. <laughs> if Abraham had stayed in the land of Ur, nothing, I'm convinced nothing would have ever changed. Uh, if God hadn't called him out, if God hadn't called me out, I'd have never come. You will not come to me that you might have life. Well, this was his hometown. This is where his family lived. He, he had a thriving idol-making business. God told him to leave without telling him where he was going. And Abraham believed God. I love those words. Abraham believed God. Doesn't say Abraham believed in a God. Doesn't say that Abraham believed there was a God. It said Abraham believed God. And it was counted in him, unto him for righteousness. If I'm to have the perfect righteousness of God that I must have, it's only going to be found in one place, and that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was made to be sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Abraham believed God and he departed as the Lord had spoken to him. You know what that was? Divine intervention. God divinely interrupting in his life. He did so to do him good. <laughs> the Lord divinely intervened in my life and he did it for my good. So sure did. God still divinely interrupts in sinners' life. Still does. You know how I know? Because the sun came up this morning. God still got some sinners to save. He still got some sheep to bring into the fold. Because when he's done, he'll fold the four corners of this up and it'll be over. My, my. You know, when Abraham left Ur of Chaldees, Lot left with him. Lot had a had a love for the world. Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. You know uh, what I've seen and experienced? If you pitch your tent toward Sodom, it's not going to be long that you'll be living there. Lot moved to Sodom, but God divinely intervened, didn't he? The scoundrel he was. God sent the angels to bring Lot out. God divinely intervened in his life. He did so with, in the life of Jacob, or excuse me, Isaac, the promised son of Abraham and Sarah. Isaac laid upon that altar of Mount Moriah. I've pictured this in my mind so many times. The knife in Abraham's hand was drawn back to kill his only son that God had given him. God divinely interrupted him. He said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. You see, the promised son is from whom the promised seed would come, that being the Lord Jesus Christ. Look down at verse 13 here in Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 22. I didn't turn you there. Verse 13, Genesis 22. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Jesus Christ is God's intervention. Joseph's whole life. Joseph, what an amazing life. His whole life was made up of divine interventions. Acts chapter 7 verse 9 says, And the patriarchs, the sons of Jacob, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God 
was with him. And he was. It's obvious in reading the scriptures. And God delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he, God, made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And Joseph's brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. From the pit to Potiphar's house, from Potiphar's house to the prison, from the prison to Pharaoh's throne, God was with him. That was the difference. God changed each course and event. From that pit to Potiphar's house, God was with him. From Potiphar's house to the prison, God was with him. From the prison to the palace, God was with him. You know what that is? And it's the same with you. Each course and event in your life, child of God, God has purpose and he works together for your good. Do we deserve it? No, it's discriminating. It's distinguishing. You can say it's not fair if you want to. I'm thankful for it. It was God that gave Pharaoh the dreams. It was God who sent Joseph to interpret. It was God who sent the famine. It was God who gave Joseph the knowledge to know what to do. It was to save Joseph, his family, and much people alive, the scripture says. Divine intervention. Years later, you know, a new Pharaoh came on the scene, was upon the throne of Egypt. He didn't care anything about the Hebrews as did the Pharaoh in Joseph's day. He was intimidated by how big Israel had gotten. He was paranoid. He was concerned with Israel overthrowing them. He determined to kill all the male children. Uh, Pharaoh told the midwives to kill all the male newborns, but God intervened. Yet Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river to drown. And there was a certain Hebrew mother and father that bare a son and hid him for three months. And when she couldn't keep him any longer for fear of his life, she put him in an ark and she sent him flowing down the very same river that he was supposed to be drowned in. You know, that's only something God can do, isn't it? And you know the rest of the story. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter found the child, raised the child as her own in Pharaoh's house, and Pharaoh paid for everything. Moses would become Israel's deliverer out of Egyptian bondage. God delivered him from Pharaoh on two different occasions when he was born. And again, when he uh, was grown and killed the Egyptian. And then 40 years later, we find Moses tending sheep on the backside of the desert. God had made him a shepherd. <laughs> and what a shepherd he became. He was a shepherd to his people. And that's how God would deliver his sheep. And you know what, David? The Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, and God sent him to take care of his sheep. Dear lamb, do you remember when you were lost? Do you remember when the good shepherd found you? Do you remember him putting him on you, putting you on his shoulder and carrying you all the way home to the fold? What happened at the Red Sea? Again, God interposed and delivered his people, didn't he? Moses cried, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And they did, and they saw it. And you know, they sung about it for a while. They sung, I'll sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. God has become my salvation. He's my God. And soon after, they went right back to their murmuring. God interfered with 
Joshua and Caleb and Samson and Daniel and the three Hebrew children, didn't he? That was certainly the case with Jonah. He himself said salvations of the Lord. And I've said this before, maybe even here. You know what follows that? Period. Salvations of the Lord, period. The end, end of the discussion. It's of the Lord. The Lord Jesus divinely intervened. That's what this book's about. Divine intervention, substitution. Jesus Christ is God's divine intervention. He intervened in the life of the woman at the well at Samaria. The man at Bethesda's pool. Bartimaeus and the man born blind in John chapter 9. He intervened. The man with the withered hand, the woman with an issue of blood, the woman bowed over who could not lift herself up. That's, that's a picture of me. The leper and the man named Legion, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus in the tomb, the Syrophoenician dog. Yea, Lord, I'm a dog. But even dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. What's that? That's divine intervention. The list goes on and on. Lydia, the Ethiopian eunuch. Some of your names are on that list. God's still divinely intervening. Why does the Lord divinely intervene in the life of the undeserving? Well, the scripture answers, this, answers it this way. It pleased the Lord to bless Israel. It pleased the Lord to bless you. It pleased the Lord to have mercy on you. Do I understand it? No, it's, un, it's beyond understanding. God's ways are past finding out. 1 Samuel 12, 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. That's, out, that's astonishing. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and earth and in the seas and all deep places. And the Lord Jesus himself said, is it not lawful, is it not right for me to do what I will with my own? No other reason that God saves his people. It's lawful. It's right. It pleases him. He voluntarily stepped in, but it ended intervened, however you want to say it, to save his people from their sin. How does the Lord do that? Only one way, in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father, but how? But by me. That's why it's narrow. That's why, the, the, beyond words, let me uh, wind this down by having you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would, please. This is the reason we're here doing tonight what we're doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching... Of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's called the foolishness of preaching, not because it's foolish, but because the world thinks it's foolish. Not foolish to you that believe, is it? Oh, it's the power of God. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now here it is. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's divine intervention. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, 
unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called. Are you called? Has God called you? Unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, Christ, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. How does God divinely intervene? What is the divine revelation of Scripture? You hear it every service. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing else among you. What do you think of Christ? You know, you might ask, how does God, how do I know that God has divinely intervened in my life? Well, the answer is always revealed by that question. What do you think of Christ? That's what it all comes down to. What do you think of him? He's God's divine intervention. Amen. Thank you so much. So good to be with you tonight. I appreciate it.